Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual breakfast. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm a field crops educator down in the southwest part of the state. I'll be hosting this morning. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Um, as you are um, going throughout the morning here, if you can just keep yourself muted, that'd be great. And we'll have an opportunity for you to get your questions in in another way. If you are planning to uh, request RUP credits particularly, we'd like you to sign in with your first and last name. So if you look at the participants window and notice that your first and last name are not there, just click on the participant list at the bottom of the screen, find your name, hover over it, and then you can click on that and then rename yourself so that we have your full name in, in our participants list. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the morning, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, just ask those in the chat box and that's also located at the bottom of your screen. And those uh, credits, both RUP and for those of you who are certified crop advisors, those credits will also be available uh, right after the presentations around 7.30 or so. MSU extension programs are open to all. The collection of demographic data from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of all Michigan State University extension programming. This is voluntary for you and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participated in this program. A uh, link will be shared in the chat box, so uh, keep your eye out for that. And we would really appreciate it if you take a moment to fill out that information. So we thank you for that. So our first presenter today is our wheat specialist, Dennis Pennington. He is going to talk to you about uh, what we need to know for uh, planting wheat, which is uh, really coming up here pretty quick. So Dennis, I am going to turn things over to you. All right, thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis Pennington, a wheat extension specialist with Michigan State University. And I'm going to uh, talk to you today. Am I got the right screen showing, Eric? Yes, looks good. Okay. Okay, so you're not on the presenter one. All right, great. Yeah, I want to share or just spend a few minutes just kind of talking about uh, planting wheat um, and uh, some of the things to consider and think about. So the first thing to consider when you're uh, uh, planting wheat is what variety you want to select uh, and, and plant. Uh, there's a number of different resources out there available to you to help make that decision. Um, I would recommend you use our uh, Michigan State University uh, Wheat Performance Trials uh, that, re that report is available at our varietytrials.msu.edu webpage. Um, in that report, we have uh, data from about 114 different varieties from 15 companies. Uh, we've got the, the usual suspects of data, um, including yield, moisture, test weight, height, color, uh, fusarium head blight ratings, flowering date, pre-harvest sprout ratings, um, and we have uh, eight locations and multiple year data uh, in that, that report. So there's a whole lot of information and I, I keep getting calls from, from growers that uh, say, well, do you have any information about this? I'm like, yep, it's in table three <laughs> in the report. So um, look through the report. There's a lot of information in there. It's also posted on the uh, Michigan Wheat website, um, the, uh, the farmer checkoff program for wheat uh, as well. So it's there. And it was also printed in the August 15 issue of the Michigan Farm News. So if any of you are Farm Bureau members uh, and receive that uh, uh, newspaper in, in the mail, um, you probably got that. It was on the last, uh, I think, four pages of, of the newspaper. So, um, but it's, it's readily available. Um, I'd be happy to share this link um, in, the, in the chat box or I can email it to you if, if you need it uh, for, for future reference. So in terms of variety selection, multi-year uh, data is most important. Um, in our trials, we have about a third of the entries get are new every year. Uh, so we don't have two and three year data on all the entry or on all the varieties that are listed um, in, in the trials. But when you're making a decision about what variety to plant on your farm, you want to know how it does over multiple years because you have different weather patterns each year and you want to know how well it's adapted um, over time. Also look at different locations. Um, I would suggest you look at the, the two locations that might be nearest to you or have the most similar type of climate or soil types is what you do. Um, and, and make sure that that variety that you're looking at is, is well adapted and does well in, in either of them 
um, uh, climates uh, or locations. The, the first and most important thing to look at when you're selecting varieties to plant is yield. Um, the, I mean, that is the most important decision. Yield should be the number one factor uh, when, when deciding which variety to select uh, for planting. A second behind that would be disease resistance and, and primarily Fusarium head blight. Um, we do have just some disease ratings in the uh, performance trial report. Um, you, you do want something that has some disease resistance um, in there. Uh, you know, in terms of controlling and managing Fusarium head blight, um, we've all heard uh, Dr. Marty Chilvers talk about the best method for uh, controlling Fusarium head blight is choose dis resistant varieties um, in combination with, with fungicides. Um, you get the, the best control um, and the least amount of vomitoxin. Um, there's information here on both red and white. In fact, the uh, yield table, uh, table one is grouped by white first and then by red. Um, so you can, uh, you know, if you're a red wheat grower, you can search through the reds or vice versa with whites. Um, there is a, a maturity column in there, um, and this is the flowering date uh, and the, uh, um, what that does, that kind of gives you a relative idea of, uh, you know, when is this thing going to uh, mature. And with, with wheat, there's not a huge range in maturities. Um, you know, when you get information from your seed dealer, you know, they might say, well, this is an early variety or a mid-season or, or a late, but really the difference is, is probably about a seven-day window and not more than 10. Um, usually it's within about a seven-day window, so there's not a big difference in the maturities, but, but that information is listed there. Um, and then there's also in table five, uh, we have response to management. Um, different varieties respond differently to management. And so if you're a, a grower that, that wants to get out there and put your nitrogen on and you don't necessarily want to have to put fungicides on, you want to choose varieties that do well under the conventional management. If you're one that wants to push yields higher and, and you like to put the fungicides on, um, then, then you want to see that you want to pick the varieties that do well under high management. There's varieties that do well under both systems. Um, but they're not the same varieties. So depending on which system uh, you're using on your farm, you'll want to select a variety that matches kind of your management style. So source of seed, um, I'd recommend planting certified uh, seed for best quality um, because the certified seed has been properly cleaned and treated and it's been run across the gravity table. So it sorts out some of the uh, uh, smaller seed um, and, and maybe, you know, damaged seed. If you are going to do bin run seed, make sure you clean and treat it. Um, this year we have quite a bit of sprouted seed um, in out in the countryside. In fact, I think almost everybody had to deal with uh, at least some level of poor falling numbers or sprouted seed. Um, sprouted seed can be planted um, if you're below 5% sprout. Um, so if you're you, if this was your seed source um, to, to plant, you can do it if you have a lower uh, sprout percent. But you're going to want to do a germ test on it to know you know what's the viability in there. And you know if you're at 90% viable seed, make sure you adjust your seeding rates to 10% um, higher so that you take into account that that sprouted seed. Um, if you have access to a gravity table, um, I would highly suggest you do that. You'll sort out some of that smaller seed. Um, you know, some of the seed that is here, you can see some of the sprouted seed. And, um, you know, if you can sort those out, that certainly would be better. You're going to want seed that looks more like this, clean and, and bright colored instead of this dull color that, that's already sprouted. Um, you know, bigger seed in terms of the size of the seed uh, means a higher thousand kernel weight, which to adds to yield. Um, but it lowers the number of seeds per pound, which means it's going to take more pounds of big seed um, when you calibrate your, your drill uh, for planting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute here. Um, you want it to be free of disease, uh, particularly stinking smut. We've had a couple of issues with, with that over the last couple of years. Um, there is some stinking smut out there, and you do not want to, if you have seed from here, you do not want to plant that. Um, because you're just going to be inoculating the field um, for future infections. And that stuff can last in the soil for, for a period of up to 10 years is what I heard. Next, I wanted to 
say one of beyond selecting your varieties, the, the, the variety selection is the first thing you do that determines what your yield potential is. The second thing is get your wheat planted early. That that is something that doesn't cost any additional money. It's not like a fungicide you have to put on or a plant growth regulator. There's not a cost to it other than you just have to plan your operation in, in your soybean maturities um, ahead of your wheat on your wheat ground so that you can get them harvested early enough so that you can plant early. And this is some data from uh, wheat peat uh, from Ontario. And you can see as you go later on in the season, you can see what your yields do. Um, they just, they tend to go down. So um, your goal in the fall, you wanna plant early enough um, so that you can get a plant that looks like this. You got your main stem, you got your first tiller coming here, second tiller coming off there. And then the third tiller is just, the first leaf of the tiller is starting to emerge right here. This is, you want this much growth and development in the fall. This is ideal. This should be what your target is. Um, so if you plant um, at one inch deep, um, it takes about 130 growing degree units uh, for emergence to occur. So I took the daily average high and low temperatures in East Lansing and did some calculations. If we planted on October 5th or October 21 or November 15th, how many days would it take for that crop to emerge? So using those daily average temperatures, um, if we planted on October 5th, it would take 12 days for that to emerge. Assuming we're planting at one inch deep and it, and it, it takes 130 um, heat units uh, to emerge. If we plant on October 21st, that number jumps to 16 days. And on November 15th, it takes 20 days. Uh, or Well, in fact, in 20 days, we, we only accumulated 43 uh, heat units in a normal year, um, which means that this may not emerge um, unless you get some heat, um, you know, outside of our, our daily averages to get that up to 130 so that it would emerge. And then, of course, if you're planting in January, it's not going to emerge until spring. So the later you go in, into the fall planting, the longer it's going to take for it to emerge. So the chances of achieving this growth and development in the fall is greatly reduced the later you plant. That should fly usually is not a problem um, in the state anymore. Um, in fact, I don't know that I've ever had or seen a, a field with uh, Hessian fly uh, problems. You can find a few Hessian flies out there on occasion, uh, but they're not causing the kind of damage that they used to cause because we have some built-in resistance um, uh, uh, to, the, to the disease. So, but just because we, you know, Hessian fly really isn't a problem. This is probably a really good date to consider starting planting wheat um, in, in your area. So, you know, if you're in um, Barry County, um, September 18th is probably a pretty good date to start uh, planting wheat, uh, just from an agronomic perspective. Um, if you plant earlier than that, uh, what can happen is you can get excessive tillering in the fall. Um, and, and then you, you got to do some management in the spring. You want to be careful with your nitrogen applications because if you have uh, more than two or three tillers in the fall, uh, you can create a problem for lodging um, closer toward harvest. So how much seed to plant? Uh, this chart um, is in the article that will be posted uh, later today um, on the MSUE News. Um, and what this does is shows the different seeding rates. Um, early in the season, you want to start at a low seeding rate. Um, so if you're planting in early September, I would be in, in this 1.2 to 1.4 million seeds per acre. Um, as you get later toward you know, the middle of October, you're in this 1.6 to 1.8. And then you go higher as you get into closer toward November or into November. We do have a planting date and seeding rate study that we have two years of data on now that we're starting to wonder if we, we may not need to go to these higher seeding rates the later we, we plant, but th that story is not complete yet. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll share that data when, when we have, you know, one more year of data on that. Um, but what you want to do is depending on your number of seeds per pound, um, that's how you determine how much, what your pounds of actual seed per acre are. So for example, if you have, let's say 13,000 seeds per pound um, and you want to target 1.6 million seeds per acre, you want to plant 123 pounds and that's what you want to calibrate your drill for. So how do you know what your seeds per pound are? Well, it's on your um, seed tag. So in this particular example, 
Um, they've got 9,993 seeds per pound. Um, so if you come back here, that is almost 10,000. So if, if 1.6 million was your, your target population, you'd want to put 160 pounds of seed on there. And make sure you calibrate. It doesn't matter what style or design or brand of you have, make sure you calibrate your, your drill um, for, for wheat and calibrate it according to um, these numbers here. Uh, so make sure you do that. Um, that way you're getting the right seeding rate on. Um, planting depth is the next thing I wanted to visit with you about. We talked about 130 uh, uh, heat units or, or growing degree uh, days um, is what it takes for emergence um, at the optimum seeding rate. So I've got the optimum seeding rate is about one inch. And the reason is because we want the crown roots to be down at about a half to three quarters of an inch deep. If you plant shallower, um, those crown roots are going to get more shallow or closer to the surface, um, and they'll provide less anchorage to resist lodging, um, you know, as the crop develops and, and heads emerge and grain fill when, when we typically get those storms that knock wheat down. And then we had quite a lot of lodging in the state this last year. So some growers tend to, if they're planting late, they will shallow their seed up and plant only three quarters or half an inch deep. Just remember that if you do that, yeah, it, it shortens, you know, your instead of 130 it only takes 105 growing degree days uh, to get that seed out of the ground uh, but you're also putting your crown roots uh, closer to the surface um, so I mean there's a trade-off there so just make sure you're you're aware of that um, uniform emergence is also very important um, in this particular case here you notice there's a big skip here and it looks like there's almost a double here and, and a double there and then you got another big skip here you want to have as uniform of a stand as possible you want something that looks a little bit more like this um, it, where it's you you can't hardly identify any gaps um, so uh, you know make sure you calibrate your drill and you get it set up and make sure everything's working right um, you're getting good uniform depth when you're planting um, so that you get emergence. Um, I have seen where, you know, in, in crusted ground, there could be uh, plants down under here if this ground is crusted that are trying to emerge that can't. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Um, if, if you get, if you have ground that, that will tend to crust like that um, and you get the right conditions in terms of rainfall, you might, you might have to deal with that. Seed bed prep is also important. Um, you make sure that uh, no-till no wheat works great, um, but if you have high amount of residue, like in this picture here, um, you got to make sure that you have your drill set up so that you can get cut through that um, and get your seed in the ground. And if you notice right here, if I zoom in on this area, you'll notice some seeds that really are getting little or no soil to seed contact. So this right there is automatically, I mean, you, you selected a good variety, you got your drill calibrated and everything else. So you're trying to keep your yield potential as high as possible. That right there is gonna lower your yield potential um, and, the, and the crop hasn't even emerged yet. So make sure you, you do good seed bed prep um, and get your drill set up so that you can get the seed planted at a uniform depth to get uniform emergence. And then hopefully this fall, we won't have this situation um, Jeff's going to tell us that we're going to have perfect fall conditions for harvest, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, so, um, yeah, if, if you have this, you know, you got to deal with this uh, as well. Even if you're in no-till, you're still going to have to deal with this. But so, and then the last thing I just wanted to wrap up with is autumn fertilizer. Uh, make sure your soil pH is in that six to seven range. If it's low, lime to a target pH of 6.5. Um, 20 to 30 pounds of N um, is, is generally recommended, although the response is variable on this. You tend to see a greater response when the soil nitrate levels are less than 10 ppm. Um, so, you know, a little bit of nitrogen in the fall can help, um, especially where you have a lower soil nitrates uh, levels. Um, and then phosphorus and potassium, make sure you keep them um, within the maintenance zones uh, uh, and apply crop removal rates. Uh, remember, we have the new tri-state fertilizer recommendations, and so instead of Bray P1, everything's in Malik 3 now. Um, so what it, this changed a little bit for wheat, not significantly, but a little bit. So instead of Bray P1, um, with this Malik 3, our new critical levels for phosphorus are 30 to 50 ppm, and then the critical levels for, uh, for K on um, sandy or lighter textured soils are 100 to 130, and then the heavier soils is 120 to 170. 
So with that, I guess if you want to take questions at the end, I can end right there. Great. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, lots of good information as always. So we have a lot of questions to go through and I'm just going to encourage you if you haven't, uh, if you've got a question and haven't put it in yet, uh, go ahead and do that. We'll stick around as long as it takes to get all these questions answered. So Dennis, I'm going to start off with uh, a question for you. If treated seed is not used, what would you expect as far as yield? Uh, the same uh, five or 10 bushels less? What do you think? Yeah, um, the only thing I would say, um, Jeff has a class to teach, and I think it's at 8 o'clock. So do you want to see if there's were there any questions for Jeff on weather-related things? Because he's going to need to get going, I think. Uh, I'm not seeing any weather-related ones yet. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Good good report, okay. and, and thanks for telling me we're not going to have, you know, <laughs> that wet conditions where we're going to tear our fields up this fall. That's, that's perfect. At least not for a week anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stand okay. by. Good, yeah. good, good clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, sorry, Eric. So um, back to the question. So related to using treated seed, um, we actually have a, a seed treatment study that we're doing. We've got one year of data. Um, we've got two more years to go on it here. Um, and what we're trying to do is measure what that impact is on the seed treatment. And we had four locations planted this year, and in only one location did we have any treatment effect um, compared to the to the uh, you know the untreated, and and it was like a a four or five bushel difference. It wasn't significant. So I think whether the seed treatment is going to um, you know, without seed treatment, how much of a yield loss you're going to have? I think it's going to depend on when you get planted, what the field conditions are, and um, um, you know, what other, you know, like what soil borne type diseases you have, um, uh, not inoculum for in your field. Okay. All right, one more question. We've got uh, 100 pounds of MAP in furrow the last few years due to the high cost of MAP. Would 50 pounds do anything? Is that enough? Yeah, so we did some work on this uh, here a few years ago, and uh, I was doing, we did MAP in the furrow, and I also did uh, 1034O, a liquid in the furrow, and uh, the goal, or the, or the target was 50 pounds of, of P um, in the furrow uh, with both of those two products. Now, I did not do a 50-pound rate, or a, um, so if you're putting 100 pounds of MAP in the furrow, you're getting 50 pounds or 52 pounds of uh, of map. So the question is, is 25 pounds of actual P adequate? Um, so I haven't done that with map specifically, but with the 1034 O, we were putting on 12.6 gallons to the acre, uh, which gave us our 50 pound rate. And there was some concern about whether that would burn the crop or not. So we did go with a lower rate um, or a half rate of 6.3 gallons per acre of the 1034 O, which gave us the 25 pound rate of, of P and that there was not a statistical difference. It was slightly lower on yield, um, but it was not statistically lower uh, than, than the full rate where we had 50 pounds of pea. So I think if you're putting in the furrow, um, yeah, I, I think you can lower that rate, and save a little bit of money. You, you might lower yield just a little bit, but I don't think it's gonna be all of that significant. Interesting. Uh, next question, uh, what if any special planting wheat after killing alfalfa or hay field, uh, planting wheat into that? Um, so yeah, to plant wheat into alfalfa. Um, yeah, I would say just terminate the alfalfa. Um, when you're planting alfalfa into alfalfa, there's some autotoxicity that occurs. Um, so you need those uh, plants kind of dead for a period of time before you can reseed alfalfa. Um, but that doesn't really um, follow through with wheat. Um, so just make sure you're getting your, your crop terminated, and then uh, I think you could plant uh, plant weed into that. Uh, not a problem. Okay. Uh, any suggestions for planting wheat into standing soybean crop? Uh, amount of leaf drop, population, any other considerations? So this used to be a common practice uh, for planting, or a somewhat common practice for planting wheat uh, back a few years ago. And, and this will occur when we have a late season uh, where it's very wet and whatnot. Guys will um, hire an airplane and they'll fly on seed. Um, and, and the goal is to get it into the soybean crop before the seed drop or the, the uh, leaf drop has occurred. 
so that when you have the leaves drop, that helps provide some coverage um, to so we can hold some moisture and get that seed to germinate and emerge. Um, this is it's not a reliable way um, of of planting alfalfa or of planting uh, wheat. I I would suggest if at all possible do. Uh, you, you know, your normal drill planting method. We do have some research going on right now where we're broadcast incorporating seed uh, and, and the results have been surprising. This last year, our yields were the same as our drilled, but that the difference between that and, and, sta and seeding into a standing crop is you're not getting any incorporation where in our research, we, we're incorporating, we're using um, uh, like a vertical tillage tool to, to mix that seed in with the soil. So without getting that mixing, you're going to have reduced stands. So you'd have to bump your rate up considerably, but I wouldn't broadcast seed into a standing soybean crop unless you had like absolutely no other alternatives. Mm -hmm. All right, here's another question. Uh, due to multiple factors, we plan on tiling a field next summer, but the field is currently in corn. Should we plant wheat late after corn harvest or plant beans next spring and tile through them? Oh, that's a good question. And that, that'll depend on a number of factors, I think. Um, so I, I think the damage in terms of economic losses you'll do to your soybean crop by trying to tile through them probably are going to be more than by what you'll lose by planting late, um, the wheat crop late. Um, it also kind of depends on what maturity uh, corn you have in there and you know when you can get the corn off. I would say, I, if it was me, I probably would opt to go ahead and plant wheat yet this fall. I would take corn off at a higher percent moisture and dry it um, so that you can get the wheat planted as early as possible. Um, and, and then that way you got that ground available for tiling um, after the wheat comes off in July. Um, another question, is there any yield comparisons between straight row and crisscrossed planting? So there's a few guys that have done this crisscross planting where they'll plant half their population, let's say going north, south, and then the other half uh, going east, west. And it gives you this kind of grid, grid shape or grid pattern. Um, the concept is to um, spread the seeds out and try to utilize as much sunlight energy as possible and capture as much as you can. Um, what does tend to happen in that situation um, is you, it, it restricts the airflow through the, the field. Um, if you think about down below, the, once you have a, a crop that's, that's say, headed out, um, you know, the, the flow through the field is reduced when you have that crisscross pattern. And what we've seen is some buildup of disease um, in those. So you got to really, if you want to do that, you can increase your yield potential, um, but you got to really pay attention to the diseases. And uh, one of the guys that I, a uh, cooperator that I worked with um, did that. And in the first year had great luck, had really high yields, like 135 bushel yield um, in the, in the field. But then the next year he had like 80 bushel yield, uh, because he had disease pressure in there. And, uh, I mean, and he's used fungicides and everything, but it still, um, had disease problems in there. So I don't, I think there's other options for, for managing your crop canopy, um, in terms of variety selection, um, in populations, uh, I'm not sure that the crisscross pattern, because you have to plant every acre twice, uh, basically. So I'm not sure that that's going to be feasible long term. Um, Paul just has a comment here. He's, he doesn't think that you can ensure flown on wheat uh, that we need to check with our, our crop insurance advisors. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Yes, I think Paul. I, Okay. Uh, here's another question. Would you ever see any advantage to planting in a, in any specific direction? I, I, no, I don't think so. Um, because you're, I mean, you're trying to predict, you know, prevailing wind direction and can you get better movement of air through the crop? Um, I, I, I just, I don't know that that, I, I, I've not tried that, I guess, but I would doubt that there would be any any benefit of trying to plant in, in one direction. Mm -hmm. So Dennis, if 
if we were looking at, I mean, we've been warm up to this point. If can you think of a scenario where if we're looking at uh, an, an unnormally warm fall, where you would recommend to folks to maybe wait a little bit beyond what they would normally wait for planting, or would you just say, you know, dial back the, the seeding rates and still plant at that that same time? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I would not recommend somebody wait for, because yeah, do not wait to plant. When you have the conditions and you, and you can plant, get it planted um, and then adjust your rates accordingly. If you're planting early, plant a lower population. Um, we're, you know, I, I think we're in a position where we're gonna start moving to some of these maybe even more ultra low populations, uh, like half a million seeds per acre, um, three quarters of a million seeds per acre because I think when we're planting early, those lower populations can yield just as well. Um, we've got some data from some of our growers that uh, it like 1 million population, uh, 140 bushel yield. Uh, so you can get good yields out of these lower uh, seeding rates, which is what they're doing in Europe. Um, they're, they're planting about a th half to a third of the populations that we're planting at the same timing that we are. Um, they do have a longer uh, grain fill period, which, um, you know, does help them out a little bit that we don't have. But um, no, I would not, if you can plant, get planted, back your population off a little bit, and then pay attention to growth and development, and then you may have to adjust your nitrogen plan in the spring, um, depending on how much growth and development you have. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any other specific questions on wheat in the chat. So if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to put those in. Uh, we've got uh, other specialists on the line this morning. Uh, do we have any other specialists who have anything interesting to share? I know we've had some, some funky insect things going on in the last couple of weeks. Chris, did you have any updates you want to give yeah, us? Yeah, I have a set of slides. I've I got to get the class here in a minute, but let me um, let me share that quick. Um, I think most of you who are on are probably just the wheat folks. But um, this is fall armyworm. If you see the picture, there is an advantage to logging in with the with the pictures rather than online. It's a very stripy pest that we usually see in corn. It has kind of a a, a Y, an inverted Y on its head. Uh, this is pictures of damage from Texas. You know, this is more of a tropical pest. So in Texas uh, and in the southern states, this is more of a typical pest for them in soybean and forages and also in, in corn. And it's not something that I, that I ever deal with. Uh, this year we have the worst fall armyworm outbreak in the last at least 30 years. And the states that I have um, have had contacts with that have this issue are in yellow here. I first heard about it from Ohio, and then we rapidly got in information out. But it's sort of, if Jeff is on, if he could plot the weather for <laughs> three to four weeks ago, we might find the dumping event that brought these from the south to the north. Uh, this is the field that Phil referred to early on. Uh, that's it's it, this is alfalfa, not a grain, and it's been completely stripped of leaves. And I'm sure that there's lots of uh, of little dudes that are feeding in there. And here's another couple pictures of them on the uh, stem. I think when people are seeing this, they're already big enough that they've done this damage, which is in the last probably one or two last instars of development. The time to have caught this would have been, you know, two weeks ago when you, if you typically walk fields. I don't know if this movie will play. It probably won't if you see it, but this is uh, harvest equipment in Wood County, Ohio, and oh it's just loaded with, with uh, army worms. And what you can't hear is some of the, co is the commentary that the people are saying. Um, and uh, so management without insecticides, luckily all these problems seem to be in forages for the most part, forage, mixed ends, grass, and fortunately also some of the small grains that Dennis might deal with. And if you can mow those forage crops now, that would be great. Take what you can. Um, but those suckers will feed under that windrow, so you got to get it dried and baled uh, as fast as possible. But this would be a really good option. Uh, the thresholds are uh, in a sweep net, two or more larvae a sweep, or two or more per square foot. And the spraying, uh, you know, you can kill small ones, half an inch or smaller, but really hard to kill big ones. They just don't 
die, you know, from a from an insecticide application. And if you're going to spray mixed stands with alfalfa and grass, remember both of those have to be on the label. It'd be better to spray in the morning or evening since these kind of don't like the real sunny days. They'll be down on the ground and you probably can use a border treatment. They all called are called army worms because they march, of course. And here's what I know about insecticides. Not much because again, I, I haven't been here for 30 years, so I haven't seen an army worm out outbreak like this. We got a lot of pyrethroids, but they can be pyrethroid resistant from the south. This chloran tranilopril is working really good. Uh, there's a product called Besiege and a couple other ones that are just chloran tranilopril alone. It is more expensive. And if you spray big ones, you know, it's just revenge. And then there's Intrepid, which is less expensive, but it's one of these products that have to be eaten. Um, so uh, uh, that's sort of what I know about fall armyworm. I've sent out the information to my Fonz facts and it's gotten out through MABA and through Kim's, Kim and Phil's email list on forages. And I don't have a lot of uh, wisdom for Dennis and some of the oats and some of these other crops because essentially they're just mowed through and gone essentially. When will these pupate, Chris, and not be in the larval stage? So the, the pictures that I've seen, there's some honking ones there that are like the size of my pinky, you know, and those would be pupating. Again, my knowledge is very low. <laughs> so I would guess in the next week, those would pupate. But if there's some variable sizes in there, uh, then, you know, maybe some are at 10 days. Um, the weather's getting cooler. So, you know, their developments may be a little bit bit uh, slower. What I don't know, the question people keep asking is, are they going to pupate? And then are they going to, you know, we're going to have another flush of them if it's warm enough. And will they then attack, you know, some of those cover crops planted later or some of the, th you know, some of the, the grains that might be planted. And uh, Kim and I have lurked, have lurked, we've lurked and looked <laughs> for, for fields, you know, to, to see an outbreak ourselves. We're both tied to campus near campus for teaching and we were not successful, but these, these little pockets are just kind of everywhere, chestening, a lot of them are down in Eric's area in Southern Michigan, Hillsdale, you know, cold water area, even by Grand Rapids, and then up into Ontario. And, you know, it's, they're just sort of everywhere. So we're going to want to keep an eye on these, uh, especially as our winter wheat that we plant this fall is emerging, make sure that we don't have army worm out there. Yeah. I mean, again, this isn't like, it's not something that we just space out. I have never seen this before. And, and it is un, it's unusual enough that even people older than me, and that's hard to do in the field crops world, are saying you know, they've not seen this before. Again, sometimes we find them in corn, but, you know, not like mowing down forages and all that. Yep. Well, that's good advice. So it's another reason to walk fields that look good. I mean, as an entomologist, I would go into fields, you know, just routinely walk into your alfalfa or wheat and stuff when it doesn't when it doesn't look like it's being eaten, because that's when you find these things when, when they would be small. Chris, a lot of these alfalfa growers are, are going to be you know, waiting now to cut that alfalfa because we're, we're going to be in the middle of September before too much longer here, but they, they may cut in the next week. A lot of them will try and get that last cutting off or at least uh, another cutting off. So if they cut, uh, would the regrowth be susceptible to these army worms or not yes i mean cutting should kill some and if it was warmer out you know during the day uh cutting will you know they'll be exposed on the soil surface and dry up or you know but or they may just start to march to an to a neighboring field which is where border treatment would be really effective um but and like I said, you may kill some, but some are going to be under that windrow or might even be bailed into the bailed dead into the into the uh, hay. Yeah, extra protein, huh? Yeah, and it, and it would be better to cut than just leave it be eaten. And again, this isn't these these infestations are just spotty. They're all over, but they're spotty. So you can walk in your field and have nothing, and they, and then you know the next town over, you may hear about some spectacular destruction. Because I think these moths rained out of some weather event like that tropical storm Fred or one of those uh, things that came up. I think they rained out over one of these events. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I, I see Kim is on too. So Kim, I've heard that even if you were to cut, that these things will continue to feed 
while your forage is, is laying on the ground, you're waiting for it to dry. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, um, if you're probably your best bet there is if you're cutting for haylage, because you're not going to have it out there uh, very long, but they, they won't really eat it after it's dry and ready to bale. But if it's fresh forage, they just think you've served them up a buffet. So they'll, they'll eat it, whether it's still attached to the ground or not. And, um, and if there's a windrow and that's, you know, they don't, they like dark and cool. So mm -hmm. they would be un, they would concentrate under that, you know, if you, and so if you leave it out there too long, or, you know, and it, or don't have conditions in which it's going to dry, right, Kim, then that's just extending yeah. their, their defoliation yeah. there. And, and, you know, if you're not having good drying weather for your hay, the longer it sits in the field, the more of it they're going to eat. Right. Um, I, I do have, it was a long time ago, but I used to uh, work in Arkansas and Texas, and I do remember this pest from down there. And um, I think it's key to what Chris said, you got to find them when they're small, because by the time you can physically see the damage, it's too late um, to save your forage crop um, because they've gotten too big. They're eating it too fast and, and the pesticides aren't going to be effective. So early scouting is is the key here so that you can because uh, they they the, the degree of damage they can cause in a very short amount of time is is truly impressive. <laughs> And that's when they're the biggest stage. Right, yeah. and this is a tropical pest, you guys. I mean, this is a pest of the tropics. We've given it to Africa and stuff. So the, the you know, this is like maybe a one-off like in 30 years, but I suspect not. I suspect that this is part of the climate change thing, mm -hmm. that these, that there's different differential weather patterns, dumping out of rain, uh, that they're overwintering a little bit further north. I, I think this is going to be the new normal where I've always said 25 years ago, I thought when I retire, Michigan's going to be more like Kentucky as far as insect pressure, because seeing this, so you might not think this is linked to climate change, but it very well might be something that could be linked to that uh, change yeah. in weather patterns and in overwintering and degree day kind of things. But we may be seeing more of these in the future. <laughs> Maybe it'll become a pest that we have to uh, think about scouting for and not uh, be surprised by it. <clears throat> Thank you both for that update. Um, Chris, you can apologize for your students or, or they can thank us, whichever, uh, for keeping you a little bit after eight. Yeah, sorry about that, Chris. That's partly my fault. No, no, it's okay. I've got to set up a lab, and Kim has class today. She's got her first class today, so. I got to go and yeah. set up my room, so. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you both. All right, any other last-minute questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any in the chat, uh, or any other comments from any of the specialists who might be on. All right, I'm not seeing any. So uh, thank you once again uh, for attending, and we will see you all back here next week.